any of you, you know, we are all passionate about Lebanon, about the diaspora, but one of the biggest problems that I find as a historian and as somebody who's been working on the subject for a good part of my life now, is that unfortunately there's a lot of mythology uh, that builds around that. I'll give you an idea. I was listening to the government uh, minister not too long ago, and in the, in the course of 30 minutes speech that this person was giving, they went from having 5 million Lebanese in Brazil to 8 million Lebanese in Brazil to 12 million Lebanese in Brazil. Uh, there's this passion that leads us to begin to, uh, you know, tell stories almost like fishing stories where the fish keeps growing with every retelling. So, for example, a lot of people think there are about 12 million Lebanese outside uh, Lebanon. The reality is it's much closer to about 5 million. Uh, but all of this is guesswork because part of the reason the center was established is because we need hard data and we go about collecting that data. So one of the things we need to get beyond is telling mythologies uh, and stories that aren't necessarily true in order to get at the real history of this amazing wave of immigration. So the first thing I'd like to address here is why did people leave? And here I will focus primarily on the first wave, which we estimate to be between 1880 and 1920s. Uh, and about that time, uh, so there are, there are a lot of stories that are told and many of them, you know, uh, about why people left. But I can honestly tell you that as, as historians have studied this, what we have found is the Lebanese from the 1880s to the 1920s. And by the way, they didn't call themselves Lebanese at that point, but I'm using it as a generic term. Those who left what we know today as Lebanon between 1880 and 1920, the great majority of them left because they were looking for a better life. And what I mean by that is, uh, as you will see, is that the economy of that area, Mount Lebanon and the surrounding areas, was going through severe crises. And many of them, like other places, like Greeks, Italians, and before them, the Irish, and also contemporaneously, the Polish uh, who came to the United States, they left because they were looking for a place to uh, work, make money, and most importantly, go back home. Uh, very few of them actually intended to stay. The majority of people who left wanted to go make enough money in five, eight, ten years and then return home and live the good life in Lebanon. For those of you who don't know what that shot is, by the way, on the right, it's June in uh, what I consider to be, you know, nicer days in some ways. It was very nice and not overpopulated. Uh, and so... Uh, in Lebanon, in, in Mount Lebanon, which is the central area, and if you see this map here, you will see that we have overlaid where we think the majority of people came. The big red dot in the Bihar Valley is Zahne. And the next one is Beirut, and then there's Tripoli. Uh, you can see that there are also people came from what we know as Palestine down south, uh, from Syria, Damascus, Aleppo. But the great majority of people who left the eastern Mediterranean around this time came from what we know today as Lebanon. And they left primarily because uh, they, the Lebanese economy was tanking. Uh, the price of silk, which is a major cash crop in the area, was uh, first stagnating in the 1870s, and then it started going down for a variety of reasons, and I'm happy to talk about them, but I don't want to go too much into that. And ultimately, uh, that and the fact that all of a sudden there are all these uh, companies that are beginning, shipping companies that are beginning to have regular boats, ships, traveling between Beirut, Alexandria, Egypt, Marseille, France, uh, allows the technology for them to, uh, to leave. And third, uh, there are people who are actively recruiting this population to come work in Brazil, to come work in Argentina, and to go work in the United States. And as you can see in terms of correlation of silk prices to rate of migration, uh, as silk prices fell and stagnated, and again, I cannot overemphasize how critical silk was the Lebanese economy at the time, you see the rise in the number of people who are traveling. And these numbers are from the United States, by the way, the number of immigrants. And from the time period, I'm just pulling up a quote by a very uh, accomplished poet, Mkhail Asad Rustum, who himself was a, for a while an immigrant to the United States, who writes about why people left. Uh, and uh, he writes it in this very long poem. And as you can see, it's basically they wanted to make money. And we have plenty of other historical evidence for that. This does not mean that there weren't other reasons, but what I'm saying here is the major reason is economic. And 
uh, as you can see, you go from a place like Beirut, which what became the major uh, jump-off point, and in essence, they travel to Alexandria, Marseille. Some go north and across to North America, some go to South America, and some go to West Africa. I apologize, I didn't include Australia. It's not because I'm dissing it, but you know, it was just too complicated to draw that line. Um, and as you can see, the immigration again, uh, the major movements are from 1900 to 1914, when World War I creates a sharp drop, as you can see from the image. Then there's a spike right after World War I, as you can imagine, because about a third of the Lebanese population died from the famine during World War I, and many of them were trying to escape. And then it drops quickly again, and here again I'm focusing on the United States, uh, because of the passage of the 1924 Immigration Act, that is very much what I would consider a racist act that prohibited the immigration uh, in any large numbers, except for those who are from Northern Europe and who are white. Uh, and here you will see that over time, this is what we see in terms of numbers. On the middle, uh, they call, by the way, they use the term Syrian, that becomes the moniker through which they knew themselves. And we can talk about identity, if you will, later. And you can see the numbers, and these are the numbers of arrivals uh, uh, using, using the US Census. And the total Syrian is going to be higher because, of course, they're having children in the United States. So the highest number we have reached by 1940, we actually, it's not on the, on the table here, but we get up to about 145,000 by 1940. And what is remarkable about Lebanese immigration, and it really kind of differentiates it from uh, other immigration, including, I would argue, like the Polish, which was uh, focused primarily in the Midwest, or uh, the Italian, which was primarily on the two coasts, is that uh, Lebanese immigration was everywhere. This is a map from 1930, and it shows you the density of immigrants, and you can hardly find a county, a populated county in the United States that they were not present in. We tend to think of immigrants as coming to the Northeast, and certainly if you look to the Northeast of the United States, uh, the blues there are darker, which means there are more people there. But that in itself is, doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, Texas was a major uh, place. And by the way, a lot of people who came into Texas came through Mexico. And I can tell you why they did that. But Florida had a large number of people. And of course, the West Coast was very uh, heavily populated by Lebanese immigrants. When they first arrived, as I said, they, they came here to work. And the easiest thing to do in many ways was to become a peddler to work with, a, if you're a woman, with a jizdain, if you're a man, with a Uh And the idea is that you really didn't need a whole lot of capital, a whole lot of experience, uh, or uh, a whole lot of language in order to carry these cases and to basically uh, travel into uh, the hinterlands of America. Imagine them, if you will, as a, a walking Amazon catalog. I mean, they really literally begin to bring products from the cities, whether it is New York City or whether it is uh, in, uh, Indianapolis, these major cities, uh, into the farming towns, into the smaller uh, hamlets across the United States. And uh, they become very, uh, you, know, to, you know, they become very ubiquitous to the point, I don't know how many of you have seen Oklahoma, the musical, there is a Syrian peddler in Oklahoma, not portrayed positively. But even in American literature, you begin to read in an early American literature, 1920s and 30s, about these quote-unquote Syrian peddlers who bring them here. Now, I don't want to romanticize this because sometimes, again, this is part of the mythology, is that they came, they worked hard and succeeded. But in fact, a lot of them failed. Uh, they failed because, you know, some of them are not adept at selling. Uh, just because they happen to be from Lebanon, there's uh, this notion that some, there's a Phoenician gene of entrepreneurship. And in fact, that's not really true. A lot of them failed. Uh, you know, it was hard work. They would be working 12, 13, 14 hours in an environment that at best really didn't care for them. At worst, was incredibly hostile to them. Uh, they were lonely. You know, sometimes they would travel by themselves for days. Uh, they had to face weather conditions. Uh, we have stories of them in North Dakota where people froze to death because of these horrendous conditions. So again, let us not romanticize this, even as we see what an amazing uh, project this is. And by the way, this is common in South America and Australia, in which uh, in Australia they call them hawkers, but this is one of the first things that they did. But it's also important to note, 
and we did we we got this from the census a snapshot that they did a lot of other things as well and sometimes we don't notice it and this is one of my favorite images uh and i would like to recognize that it's from the arab american national museum that uh, and uh, it's about you know uh eva hatte who works with uh, in the ford factory you know and if you look at this pie chart about a third of those who came here worked in factories in fact in loris massachusetts uh syrian workers uh next to new york that was the largest population for a while of immigrants and they were all working in the textile factories and, and lowers i mean really quite phenomenal amount but also some of them worked in agriculture especially in the midwest and various other things now beyond work many of them imagine they would come here work and go back but of course they they stayed and they stayed and they stayed and about two-thirds in the united states stayed permanently and so as they stay, they had to begin to build community. And there are different ways in which they build this community. Food, of course, becomes very important. Uh, but they also, you know, places of worship, churches, mosques, and for the Druze, of course, associations. And you can see that all across the United States, and this is from the 19, by 1924, you can see that a lot of churches and mosques and were being established across the United States. It wasn't an easy task. I mean, again, I can go into detail about how complicated it was to even set up a church and all the tensions that emerged from that about, you know, who's running the church, the priest doesn't like the parish and the parish doesn't like the priest and a variety of stories. But they were very dedicated to building these places of worship because they become focal points for the community that reminds them. And just, I mean, for a moment, for those of you who come from a Christian tradition, imagine for a moment uh, smelling bachur, the incense. Uh, and even if you're sitting somewhere in the middle of the United States, to smell that bachur is to be transported almost instantaneously to the church in the daya, in the small village. Uh, if you are of the Muslim persuasion and you hear the call to prayer, that Arabic evokes emotions in you and keeps you tied. In other words, not only are they building community, but they are building community in a way that they may wanted to maintain a sense of identity of who they are. They didn't come here to erase themselves. They came here to make money. And other things they did was to create these secular social organizations. They could be anything from a family-based one to a national-based one. A lot of them actually were uh, philanthropic aid groups, you know, for uh, helping people in burials, because burials are obviously expensive, or if there's a, uh, somebody who is uh, disabled and they cannot work anymore to help them in that regard. Or simply to just have these annual gatherings, uh, you know, whether it's the Hamena Club, uh, for those of you know, who know Hamena, it's a big town, wonderful town in uh, Mutton, in Lebanon, to this huge uh, uh, Silver Jubilee celebration in Brooklyn, New York, of one of the major Arab American newspapers called Al Huda. So there are tons of these activities. And I just want to give you a quick glimpse here, just to give you a notion. Now, here we're looking from 1899 to 1950s. And remember, we're talking about a population of about 150,000 at most, and yet they sustain nearly 60 periodicals in Arabic. That is absolutely phenomenal for this kind of community. Uh, even though a lot of them, by the way, were illiterate, they would still subscribe uh, to uh, Al-Huda, Manat al-Gharab, Kaukab America. And some of these newspapers and magazines would last a year or two, others lasted decades. And it's really quite phenomenal. And it's really important to keep in mind that this community wasn't just simply working, they were actually uh, also producing culture if you will. And you can see here some samples of the newspapers. And by the way, the, uh, the center, the Kherala Center, is, has a massive project to collect any uh, existing uh, newspaper from this time period, digitizing it, and we just released a completely searchable database of these Arabic newspapers that you can search in Arabic. And I'm happy to show you a little bit of that later. Uh, not only are they were talking about newspaper, culturally speaking, they produce music. And again, think about it for a moment. We had 10 recording studios, most of them on Washington Street and uh, what we know today as Manhattan, New York. 10 recording studios and 40 uh, uh, artists active between the 1920s and 1960s. And these guys would travel throughout the United States. Uh, I'll just give you a, a brief sample of that just so you can hear it. <laughs> Yalla, <laughs> 
So again, this is just a, a small sample of uh, the kind of music, uh, early Arab American music, Lebanese American music that we've been collecting. Uh, and uh, in the exhibit that we are hof uh, hopefully releasing in uh, mid-September that celebrates all this cultural activity, we will have a much larger sampling of these early records. Uh, and aside from the press and music, you have people like Afifa Karam, one of the earliest uh, Lebanese American novelists and feminists. Uh, but you also had seven, at least seven major and six major female writers who published over 100 books and essays. Uh, and it's not simply that these, these people were writing, uh, you know, editorials or stories or novels uh, or uh, art critiques or anything just for the community in the United States. In fact, their influence transcends the United States and they reshape the very Arabic language as these Mahjari writers, and they were in constant communications. So Al-Rabit Al-Qalamiya, which is Gibran Khalid Gibran's, uh, you know, intellectual uh, literati uh, group, was in constant correspondence with the Andal al Andalusia, or the Andalusian uh, bond, which was established in uh, South America, that also was of literary uh, writers. And all of them were writing to people in Egypt, writing to people in Lebanon, uh, and this constant communication shaping it. It's really actually, uh, if you think about it, it was right now we like to think of ourselves as very, you know, global. Uh, they were equally so, believe it or not, even though it would have been slower, of course, with a telegram or the boat instead of the internet and the plane, but they were very much existing in a global setting themselves. At the same time that they were building these communities, there were also realities, the realities that tugged at the very fabric of the community that made it difficult to actually come together. One is distance. You know, uh, sometimes in, uh, in the South, in the Midwest, or even in the Northwest, you would have a family or two or maybe three at most in a whole county. And even though they would come together and they may subscribe to a newspaper that comes to them from New York, they were all alone there. And I think there's a sense sometimes we forget that this loneliness was very difficult for them to bear. Uh, you know, we do not know really the impact uh, on mental health of immigration. That's a topic that is begging to be studied in this time period. But you can imagine if somebody lands up in Oklahoma or in you know, Colorado and them, by themselves and their you know, a spouse and children, uh, the, the ability to maintain a sense of who you are, the ability to just hear Arabic, all of that becomes so much more difficult. And distance becomes really a serious issue that we cannot ignore. But also, as much as people work to you know, use religion as a way to come together, I don't think any of you will be shocked to know that religion was also dividing people. So not only did the, you know, uh, Rome Orthodox or, or uh, you know, the Syrian Orthodox and the Maronites come to blows in the streets of New York, but even within the same religious community, there were all sorts of tensions about, you know, who is to, you know, uh, who is going to speak for the community? Uh, who is going to be the priest for the community? Uh, is this priest really liked by others? And so on and so forth. And there are lots of stories to be told about this. But religion, in some ways, as much as it creates a focal point for the community, it also becomes uh, one of those fissures within the community that sometimes leads to a lot of tensions. The other element that really becomes a, a big question for the community is gender. We know that, and this is comparing immigration of men and women, of course, there's you know, somewhat more men that came, especially early on, but very quickly women came as well, either as part of the family, for family reunion, or they came by themselves. Uh, the mother of Gibran Khalid Gibran, uh, left an abusive husband in Pshadri, and she brought her children, including Gibran, to Boston, and she worked. And the fact that women, when they arrive here, begin to work, because remember, the whole point of them is coming here is to work, so they can make money. They worked in factories, as you can see from this picture. Uh, they worked as peddlers. And the fact that all of a sudden, especially outside the context of a small village where everybody knows everybody, that these women are working you know, side by side with strangers or encountering non-family members leads to a crisis in patriarchy and gender. People begin to be very anxious about honor and shame. I, well, oh, how is this happening? And, you know, of course, 
when people are living so far away from Lebanon, uh, the reality is new living arrangements emerge. So we have stories of women who leave their husbands in Lebanon and begin to cohabit with somebody else. And of course, you can imagine the scandalous notions that emerge from that. But it's also that as women begin to work and acquire money, they acquire power, power to renegotiate the patriarchal contract that is very different. And second, they are in a new environment, whether it's in Argentina or the United States or Australia, in which a suffra suffrage movement, the you know, uh, movement to give women the vote, uh, feminism is emerging. They're beginning to articulate greater demands. And those, if you will, uh, you know, play out. There's a very uh, wonderful short story called Timthal al or the Statue of Liberty, in which uh, Abdul Masih Haddad, who is uh, an author and the publisher of Murat al uh begins, uh, tells the story of this man who just is not successful at peddling, but his wife is brilliant at it. And what you see throughout the story is a shift in the power dynamics. Uh, and at one point, he confronts his wife saying, you know, you're not cooking for me, or, you know, you're always out of the house. And she looks at him and says, you know, uh, and this is in the short story, back in Lebanon, you used to have all the power over me. Now, you know, I am free because of the Statue of Liberty. So you can imagine these tensions that begin to emerge as well. And let us not forget that as non-whites, as people who are speaking a foreign language, who are practicing a foreign faith, as people who have darker skin, uh, as people who are coming from a foreign land into an America that was very much, especially in the, 19, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, very much defined by a fraught racial landscape, right? This is the era of American nativism. Uh, this is the era of the KKK. Uh, they're not coming into a neutral place. At best, they are tolerated. At worst, they're attacked and they are reviled as people. And it's not only happening here, it's happening in South Africa, it's happening in Argentina, and it's happening in Australia. That these immigrants are creating anxieties for the uh, existing population, the white existing population, and a lot of people do not want them coming in. And so you see somebody like Senator Reed from Pennsylvania, who basically claims that these immigrants are trash, right? And there's a very, they begin to use almost medical language to see them as uh, viruses and microbes that are infecting the he healthy white Anglo-Saxon body. And somebody like Michael Steed, who comes from Marjayoun, uh, and who establishes the first, uh, what I would consider to be cooperative hospital in Elk City in the western part of Oklahoma, talks about racism. And he basically is despairing. He says, you know, it's, it, it, it's not only the working class and the lower class that are racist, it, it goes all the way from top to bottom, and they're never going to accept us. And tragically, probably one of the most tragic aspects of this is, and there are many acts of violence against these immigrants, by the way, things we don't usually like to talk about, but these are real, is the murder and then the lynching of uh, Hassan and Ula Rumi in Lake City, Florida. As I said, we finished uh, a documentary on this, both in Arabic and English, and I'm happy to talk more about this. And also, you can go to our website and you can watch it uh, for free. It's, you know, you can stream it. Uh, and this was a very tragic amount of, you know, tragic moment, if you will, in the history of the community. Uh, so, but, you know, not only are they coming here and working, what I really think is important to understand about immigrants is immigrants don't just assimilate in a sense that they simply become American. Actually, what they do is it's a dynamic relationship between them and the existing society. They change, but they also change the society. I'm going to give you very brief examples. Uh, these Lebanese immigrants who work in Lawrence, Massachusetts, in the factory, uh, percentage-wise, not numerically, but percentage-wise, they were the they, they represented the highest percentage of leaders of the labor strike, the most major labor strike in the United States, called the Bread and Roses strike. Sorry, it's misspelled. It should be B-R-E-A-D, the Bread and Roses strike. And they were very heavily involved in the early union movement uh, in the United States. Uh, you have somebody like uh, Dr. Herbert Nasour, who gets his medical degree in uh, AUB, and Dr. Michael Sheed, both of whom are very keen about the impact of racism and uh, classism on affordability and accessibility of healthcare. And both of them spend their whole life trying to make healthcare accessible and affordable to those on the margins of society, whether it's because they are quote unquote Mexican or non-white uh, or because they don't have money because they're poor farmers in the Midwest. And then you have somebody like, uh, you know, a performer, Princess Rahmi Haider. Her name is Rahmi Haider, but she called, and she's originally from Balbak, 
uh, in the Bihar Valley, but she creates this persona. What's interesting about her is that uh, she and many others like her, by the way, she tours the United States and uh, Canada uh, between the 1920s and 1930s, and she does so uh, to reclaim you know, the right to define what the Middle East is. Uh, what I mean by that is she's touring primarily into churches, and she's claiming, look, all these churches across the United States talk about the Holy Land, but you have no idea what the Holy Land is. Let me explain to you what the Holy Land is. And this is not a small thing. I mean, I know it sounds like it's just a performance. But in fact, she becomes a cultural mediator. Because you have to remember that at the time, the image of the Middle East is that it is one of these backward places that is just, you know, hasn't changed since the time of Christ. And she's introducing to them something very different. And she's not the only one. Amir Rehani is doing on the lecture circuit. Mikhail Aini is doing the same thing. They're trying to redefine the Middle East, to advocate for the Middle East uh, in America by these lecture tours. So this overall image, and I'm going to stop here because I really want to allow our uh, time to talk about uh, any Q&A you have. So in all of this, then, what you see then is a community that is coming to the United States originally to make money and go back, but many of them stay. And in staying, they not only change themselves, some of them succeed, some fail. The same person could succeed and fail. Uh, but they also change America. They change America in many profound, tangible way. And they become part of the very fabric of the society. They fight in America's wars. They work in its factories. They walk along its roads. They help build America as we understand it today. So they are very much an integral part of the history of the United States. At the same time, what I think is important to understand about this first wave, and I would argue of every wave of Lebanese immigration, is that they are also central to how Lebanon is shaped. Not only are they just simply focused here, but the letters they sent, the money they sent, the, you know, the objects they sent, the ideas they share, and themselves when they go back, all of that transforms Lebanon. Uh, I'll give you a very quick example. If you go to the AUB campus, you will find something called the Yafet Library. Jafet was an immigrant who went to Brazil and made a lot of money building a textile factory, and he gives money to that. And if you look throughout Lebanon, by the way, it is dotted with cl health clinics and schools that are funded by these immigrants in that regard. And so what I'm trying to argue here is that when we look at this history, when we preserve it and share it, we retell the story of America and we retell the story of Lebanon. And that is something that is absolutely vital, not only for the Khairala Center, but for all of us. Thank you so much.